Namesh, can you hello. Um, hello and welcome back everybody to um, the uh, to the Unite Global Summit. Uh, I am delighted to uh, present our next panel session, uh, focusing on the need for parliamentarians to press for drug policy reform. Um, I'd like to send out a very special thank you to uh, our in partners at uh, the Open Societies Foundations, with whom we've been working now for several years, uh, for support for this specific um, session. The panel will be moderated uh, by our partner and a very good friend in the United Kingdom, Mike Trace. Uh, as you might all know, Mike has a wide range of uh, experience in the field of drug treatment and policy, from direct work with problematic drug users to senior positions in national government and international agencies. Mike Trace is currently the CEO of uh, a forward trust, a social enterprise that empowers people to break the cycle of crime or addiction to move forward with their lives. Uh, he previously held positions as the chief of demand reduction section of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and also as chair of the International Drug Policy Consortium Board of Directors. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. I pass the stage uh, to you. Thanks very much, Ricardo, and welcome, everybody. Uh, as Ricardo has uh, told us, this is uh, session five of the UNITE Summit, um, and uh, it's on the subject of drug policy. Um, it's also the launch, uh, as Ricardo has said, of a partnership between UNITE and the United Kingdom uh, Parliament uh, parliamentary group on um, drug policy reform. Uh, we'll be hearing from one of the co-chairs in a moment, uh, uh, from that group, but uh, the United Kingdom group is one that I advise, um, and that's why uh, I've been asked to moderate this session. So uh, I look forward to this session. Um, as uh, Ricardo says, I've worked in this field for many years in a uh, non-government and governmental and intergovernmental role. So drug policy is something I've been involved in with a long for a long time. But I am guessing that the audience we have here is uh, a, a wide range of people. Some people like myself who've been involved in drug policy debates for many years, others for whom it's a, a relatively new subject. Uh, so we, uh, we have spoken amongst ourselves as the panel today to try and address our comments to the most expert and the newest arrivals to the subject. So uh, that is one challenge to us as speakers. Um, I particularly want to welcome those of you uh, watching this session who themselves are parliamentarians who work around the world in legislative chambers. Um, as I say, the UNITE Network and the UNITE Partnership with APPG is trying to develop a, an international group of parliamentarians who are interested in drug policy reform and want to get involved in this network and see how the network can help them to introduce uh, initiatives and legislative reforms in their own countries. So I particularly speak to all of you as uh, uh, parliamentarians that through this sessions and after this session, please sign up through the Unite website. Uh, I think my colleagues will present an email address for you to contact on the chat uh, line and just uh, register your interest through that email address. You can see it on the screen now and um, we will include you in communications as we build this network in the coming months. So welcome everybody. We look forward to an interesting panel. Uh, we have 90 minutes. Um, as you all can see, uh, we are dependent on technology here. Uh, I understand it's gone reasonably well for the summit so far, but we are subject to uh, the quality of uh, Wi-Fi and the quality of international links. Uh, this is a new way of conferencing. Uh, on the downside, it means you have to provide your own coffee and biscuits. On the upside, it does mean that people all around the world can engage in a, uh, in a symposium, a presentation, a discussion uh, without leaving their own home countries or indeed their own homes. Uh, the platform seems to be working so far, but please bear with us if there are any technical hitches that myself and my colleagues have to resolve, just uh, if you wait patiently for us to get it uh, resolved and get back to you. We hope that all the speakers are visible to you. Uh, we have six speakers today in this 90-minute session, and obviously we hope that all the presentations are 
audible to you. Um, most of them are live, but we have a couple of pre-records uh, that will be played to you in the uh, appropriate point in the uh, session. We have uh, a quite two, hopefully two question and answer sessions. I would encourage the audience members to submit questions through the chat box on the uh, right hand side. Uh, myself and the organizers will try to keep uh, an eye on those questions coming in and put them to the speakers in a couple of uh, points in the uh, uh, in the proceedings. So uh, yeah, please uh, audience participation as you um, uh, as you um, as you have done. So uh, got a couple of changes to the published lineup. Unfortunately, Chloe Swarbrick from New Zealand has been taken ill today and is unable to join us. Um, particularly uh, disappointed. We wish Chloe well, obviously, but. Um, we, as many of you know, New Zealand has a very live parliamentary debate right now around a cannabis uh, regulation referendum. Uh, Chloe was going to be uh, available to give us an update on that. I'll try to say a few words about it myself in, uh, in a moment. But generally, New Zealand is a very interesting country in drug policy reform at the moment. Um, the other change is uh, Crispin Blunt, who is with us, uh, has to... Uh, be in the UK parliamentary chamber in half an hour. So um, uh, we've moved Crispin right up to the front of the speakers. Obviously, one of the uh, risks of uh, having parliamentarians as speakers is they get to speak in their parliament as well. So that's what's happened for Crispin. He needs to be in the chamber in half an hour. So we're putting him to the top of our speakers list. Um, so technology seems to be working now. Um, just a few introductory words from me on um, drug policy before I pass to Crispin. Um, you may be asking why Unite, which is fundamentally a health network, is, uh, is pursuing a work stream on drug policy. And the answer to that quickly is that Unite and APBG and all of our partners think of drug policy as a health issue. We think this is all about protecting health, protecting public health and individual health, and uh, reducing health inequalities. Whereas for many years, almost a century, in fact, um, a lot of drug policy has been dominated by security thinking and uh, criminal justice thinking. And uh, you will all be uh, uh, acquainted with the term war on drugs. Um, and that has been the dominant paradigm under which the international community has responded to psychoactive drug use for, as I say, almost 100 years. And, and the elements of that war on drugs approach have been uh, that there is zero tolerance for the use of drugs, the possession of drugs, the, the selling of drugs, and there is zero tolerance for drug users. The, the action is disapproved of in society. And the idea was that by disapproving and punishing and arresting people and seizing drugs, that would be the way to eradicate a problem that was seen as a, a bad thing. But particularly in the last 20 years, and many people would say they, they, they had pointed this out many years previously to that, it's become clear that that war on drugs approach, that criminal justice, that punitive approach has been ineffective in achieving what it wanted to achieve, which was eradication of a, of a health harm. Um, it's been clear that a shift has been needed. The, um, uh, the drug market, if you like, the illegal drug market has thrived, particularly over the last 40 years, uh, a massively increased numbers of drug users around the world. UN estimates are between 250, 300 million regular users of drugs. Um, massive increases in markets, massive increases in profits going to uh, organized crime by their control of those markets. So the, the eradication definitely has not been achieved, but also the reduction and the suppression of uh, the illegal market has not been achieved. At the same time, uh, many of the things we've been doing uh, through drug policy, repressive drug policy, have made things worse. They certainly have made some of the health problems worse. Um, the prevalence of drug use, I say, has been higher, and the harms associated with it, whether they be health harms, overdoses, infections such as HIV and AIDS, uh, social problems, the marginalization of poor communities, the marginalization and criminalization of costs of criminalizing millions of people have been had a lot of knock-on effects. So a lot of what we've been trying to do to eradicate the problem over decades has actually made the problem worse. 
specifically, and that's why we're here today, uh, a lot of what we've been doing in drug policy has made health problems worse. Uh, overdoses and deaths related to uh, uh, drug use have uh, spiraled over the last 10, 20 years, particularly um, just when we have been trying to reduce them. And uh, that's largely because the people who are using drugs in, in risky ways are, are forced more into the margins and drug use is becoming a more and more dangerous activity leading to more and more overdose deaths. And that's because we have generally pushed people who use drugs to, push, to use them in more risky ways. Uh, we, the HIV expansion over the, uh, uh, particularly the 80s and beyond, uh, and hepatitis as well, those infections to a large degree have been driven by uh, uh, drug injecting. And those health problems have been made worse by the criminalization and marginalization of those people using drugs. So there's clar growing clarity that health-based approach, a shift to a health-based approach is needed. Uh, and many countries have already moved in that direction and, and have seen reasonably good results. And uh, um, countries in Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, and in Asia have, have moved. Um, we're going to hear examples today of countries that have moved in towards a more health policy orientation. That direction of evidence as travel has been gradual, but consistent over the last 20 years. But there is an awful, also an awful lot of resistance. And that, that resistance, to some extent, is is uh, ideologically based. There's a lot of people who still hold to the idea and governments who still hold to the idea if we just get tougher, we, we show zero tolerance, then uh, we will win the battle. But there is also an inertia. You know, Many governments broadly agree that a change of direction is needed, but there is not the legislative time or the political will to push forward. And that's why parliamentar parliamentarians are very important in this issue is to bring forward where the executive may not be giving it priority, parliamentarians should be bringing forward reforms and modernizations that otherwise wouldn't happen. And it's the intention of this UNITE and uh, UK Parliamentary Group Partnership to give support to any parliament parliamentarians who want to do that, to share ideas and um, back any initiatives in any given country. So I encourage you all to engage with this network I encourage you all to engage with this session um, and um, uh, we hope we can uh, give the the network and this particular work stream of the Unite family, give it a good kickoff today. So thank you for your attention to these introductory comments. Uh, you'll be hearing more from me as the moderator later, but I'd like to pass for our first example of a parliamentary group fighting this modernization fight. I'll pass to my colleague, Crispin Blunt, MP, who is a co-chair of the UK Parliamentary Group on Drug Policy Reform. Crispin. Hi, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, as you say, I'm uh, co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Drug Policy Reform in the United Kingdom. And indeed, I'm the first Conservative uh, Member of Parliament to be uh, a co-chair. And uh, the reason I have taken this issue up is uh, I was the prisons uh, minister and the minister for probation and youth justice under David Cameron when he first formed the government in uh, 2010. And over two and a half years in that role, uh, I saw the dreadful price uh, being paid by the criminal justice system for being given the responsibility uh, largely of delivering drugs policy and for it being seen as a criminal justice problem, not as a public health issue. And uh, when, uh, in 2017, uh, I uh, finished, uh, not entirely voluntarily, my role as uh, chairman of the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, I then decided that this issue was uh, so important and of consequence to uh, so many countries around the world and not being properly dealt with uh, and uh, on the basis of evidence um, to devote uh, largely the rest of my time uh, in, uh, in Parliament with my ministerial career behind me uh, to this uh, issue. And so I'm really pleased with this development uh, of a unite, of getting parliamentarians together to discuss this issue in a place where we can talk about the evidence and the approaches that work and to try and understand how uh, in the United Kingdom, for example, uh, the popular press in the 1960s uh, helped reinforce the uh, an American approach to this. Uh, taking over from the British approach to drugs policy in the 1960s, a 
this is a historic footnote, but where we treated uh, heroin addicts, for example, uh, by uh, helping them manage their addiction through the health system. And all of that stopped uh, with the prohibitionist approach uh, delivered with its foundation in the UN Treaty of 1961 uh, and then delivered through uh, subsequent legislation uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, around the world. And uh, we as parliamentarians uh, need to be the people who are going to point out to the executive if they continue on this path, uh, then uh, we need to say that the emperor has no clothes. We are faced, in terms of the outputs here, a policy catastrophe on a global scale. Uh, and uh, this subject uh, deserves our attention and it deserves to be treated on the basis of the evidence because far too many people are dying. Uh, far too many governments and administrations are significantly corrupted by the vast amount of money that public policy has gifted into the hands of uh, organized crime. And uh, of course, this issue is of very wide application. I want to just uh, finish my remarks by illustrating it in terms of one uh, small issue uh, where uh, we have tried to address uh, uh, the issue of people who inject drugs. They do it dangerously. And uh, around Europe and in many places, uh, people have now begun, countries have begun to establish um, overdose uh, prevention centers where people can go and uh, use their illegal drugs safely, but to inject themselves in uh, a safe environment uh, where the antidote uh, uh, to any overdose is to, is to have um, under medical uh, supervision. But of course, those facilities uh, need some form of immunity from police action because uh, uh, inevitably. Uh, they are formally engaged in uh, a criminal process. And so uh, many countries have made the case and produced the evidence um, for uh, overdose prevention centers to be able to be used by people and address significant uh, drug problems uh, in their communities. Uh, however, um, uh, the names of these things originally, either as drug consumption rooms or supervised injection facilities, uh, were not names that uh, necessarily made the host communities uh, wild about having uh, these, uh, these centres in their community, but name them for their purpose, which is to prevent overdoses, overdose prevention centres. I hope we can begin to change the rhetoric and the understanding around what is attempted to be achieved. We want to reduce overdose deaths. And we want to improve uh, public health by reducing the transmission of bloodborne diseases. And of course, uh, those centres then provide a base for where uh, drug users, injecting drug users, can get in touch with the public health people who can then uh, be the professionals who help them on their road to recovery uh, from their addiction. And of course, we've seen the benefits of the communities that do host these centres uh, by the reduced drug-related litter and the visibility uh, of uh, drug misuse in their communities. Now, we've had in the United Kingdom, uh, local authorities and uh, uh, my parliamentary group are pushing the United Kingdom to sanction a more overdose prevention centres for years. But the government has been resistant, uh, citing the Misuse of Drugs Act, um, saying that, the, uh, that what we would get here is inadvertent legitimisation. Um, but all of these are based on a moral objection um, uh, to uh, drug use. And they do not pay uh, sufficient attention um, to the overwhelming evidence now from around the world of harm reduction. Uh, so uh, the all-party parliamentary group, uh, together with other organizations and local authorities, have uh, written to the government uh, trying to persuade them uh, to undertake uh, a license uh, use of these overdose prevention centers in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we've even got a situation where uh, in Scotland there is political unanimity on the recognition of the benefits of these centers and with great challenge in in Glasgow, uh, Scotland's uh, largest city, uh, uh, they still cannot get permission from the United Kingdom government because that's where the responsibility sits on uh, criminal justice um, and under law, uh, permission for these centres to open. Um, and indeed, uh, what we're trying to do is to create a climate of opinion where a small advance can be made, where we can get over those prevention centres open. Uh, with uh, the tolerance of the uh, criminal justice authorities, 
police and the federal government, uh, in order um, to reduce our health challenges. And uh, indeed, just last week, a community activist opened his own um, overdose prevention centre in Glasgow, a mobile OBC. And we wait to see uh, what happens uh, with that great initiative. All I can say is he hasn't been arrested yet. Um, but we will continue pushing in the United Kingdom on this narrow issue, but also on a whole wide range of issues, of trying to get a, uh, ideally, in the United Kingdom context, a royal commission to look at the whole business of the costs and benefits of the prohibition of narcotic drugs and invite them to make recommendations about how we might change this. Uh, in this, it would echo the work of the Global Commission on Drugs Policy and for active parliamentarians today to be involved in this. I really, really welcome your presence here because it is simply not good enough for former presidents and prime ministers of the nations of the world to join together in the Global Commission on Drugs Policy and point out what they ought to have done uh, whilst they were in office uh, to address the terrible, catastrophic consequences of global policy as it is today. As the parliamentarians of today, we can press for our executives to take up their responsibilities now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Crispin. And um, I think you've met the target to uh, be able to speak, to give you time to get across the road to uh, put some pressure on our own foreign secretary. So we don't want to delay you in that that task. Um, thank you. And if you if you are able to come back for the final Q&A session, I'm sure there will be uh, some questions around uh, the issues we've discussed so far. So thank you very much, Crispin. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Lord Simon Woolley, also based in the UK Parliament. Um, and this is, this is to talk about one particular aspect and concept uh, around drug policy reform is the way it's, uh, it's been applied over the years and the way punishments have been applied um, uh, in terms of equality and uh, diversity. So, uh, uh, Simon, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, also thank you to my fellow panellists um, and fellow parliamentarians out, out there. Uh, I, when I normally give an address, I'd like to see the people that I'm speaking to. And uh, I wish I could see you. I wish I could look at you in the eyes uh, to have this address because this is such an important debate. And it's such a debate that we're having right now. So before I talk about the, the inequalities, the racial inequalities uh, around drugs policy and around the solutions, I'd like to spend a minute or so talking about the historical context that we find ourselves in, because I think it's crucially important that, are, that around the world we've had this global pandemic of COVID-19 uh, that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and we've had another pandemic too that has paralleled COVID-19, and that has been the brutal death of George, George Floyd the African-American who many of us seen murdered right in front of our, our eyes. And I think what this double pandemic has done is convulsed our society, convulsed our governments to confront some of the gross inequalities in our society. And one of those deep-seated inequalities whether you're in the USA, the UK, or France, or Portugal, has been the racial aspect of inequalities. And I know, having worked in this area for over 25 years, that one of the biggest areas of state oppression, humiliation, control, has been through the prism of drugs policy towards people of color. In the USA, in the UK, our prisons are full of black and brown people who have come foul on the war on drugs. But what this moment has done, COVID-19 and the death of George Floyd, has made us confront ourselves to say, 
if not now, then when can we confront these deep-seated racial inequalities that blight people's lives? In the worst cases, of course, deaths of vast numbers of people through drugs policies, through the gangs that flourish through the way uh, that we orchestrate our state drugs policy. And I would hope if there's one thing from this Unite Global Summit that we as parliamentarians, as parliamentarians say at this time, we are not going to tweak around the edges for policy reform and say it's business as usual today. Today we will say that we'll be bold and brave and confront these inequalities that ruin so many people's lives. This is the challenge. Here in the, the UK for far too long and in the USA, we've seen our law enforcement officers go about their business looking for people who look like me, whether it's in a suit or a hoodie, and say to themselves, I need to stop and frisk and harass and humiliate because these are the people who take drugs, who sell drugs, and it's used as a dreadful form of oppression. What has struck me in this global pandemic, in the height of the pandemic in the UK, when everybody was uh, uh, trying to protect themselves in their homes, 95% of the people were indoors. But the law enforcement officers here in the UK raised their stop and search, in America you call it stop and frisk, by 25% towards African and Caribbean individuals. Crime went down. Stop and search for black people went up by 25%. What does this tell us? What does this tell us about our, our society? Well, it tells us that our law enforcement officers often around the world see us as potential criminals. We've seen on our UK TVs what we call video nasties of police officers stopping cars. There was one video of a young couple, uh, an Olympic couple, they're Olympic athletes, and they, uh, their car was brought to a halt. And the police officer drew out his truncheon, ready to smash the window screen if the occupants didn't get out the car. They were dragged out the car whilst their three-month-old baby, three-month-old, was in the car. This, was the, this is the type of trauma that law-abiding individuals have to face on a regular basis because we are punitive drugs policy in this country. My uh, fellow parliamentarian, uh, Crispin, Crispin Blunt, talked about the incarceration the mass incarceration of people who look like me. Our youth incarceration for African, Asian, and Caribbean community is at 51%, even though we only make up less than 18% of the population. This racialization of drugs policy is not just in the UK, it's in the USA, it's in Brazil, it's in Colombia, it's in France, it's in Sweden. I would argue it's in so many places around the world. M my, my ask from you is that if the, we, we confront the racialization of punitive drugs policy around the world, we will be doing one of two things. One, we will ensure that we have an adult conversation about drugs policy that will benefit everybody, black and white. Most people take drugs, many people take drugs. 
But so why are we targeting? Why are we targeting uh, uh, disproportionately black and brown people? But secondly, too, we'll be saving lives. We will save lives because we will look at drugs policy through the prism of public health. Those that take drugs, make sure they're taking drugs safely. Those that have problems with drugs, ensure they get help. The, the hundreds of millions of dollars, pounds, can be refocused, not on this punitive law enforcement approach, but to be tackling the very big gangs and to be tackling other aspects of criminality. This is a moment in our history. This deadly disease, COVID-19, and the death of George Floyd has given us once in a generation opportunity to look at our policy, to look at how it's not working, how it alienates, how it demonizes. We have a chance, an opportunity to take something so dreadful like the death of George Floyd, like COVID-19, and build something better, build something fairer, in which people who look like me can be seen for their quality, for their creativity, for their dynamism, and not as criminals. It's up to you, my fellow politicians. I want you, as I wake up every day of my life, believing I can change the world. I want you to believe that too. In this Unite Global Summit, 2020. This is our time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, some strong words and strong challenge to us there um, uh, to, to put some uh, historical wrongs right. Um, and as Simon has said, if you look at the statistics in any country, if you look at the statistics of the, uh, the groups who are uh, using drugs and compare that with the groups who are uh, confronted and arrested and punished for using drugs, you will find uh, all sorts of uh, disconnects and uh, inequalities there. And uh, the other inequality is uh, uh, between rich and poor. Uh, we all know in all of our societies, all of our cultures, that uh, uh, drug use exists across all social classes. Um, but you will find that the people who end up punished and in prison are the poorer social classes and the more excluded groups. So it's one way to start. If you're new to this subject in your country, just have a few looks at those statistics and see whether that is a just system or not. So thank you very much for that, Simon. I'm sure there'll be questions coming back to you related to that in our Q&A sessions. I note from the chat, and I'll, I'll pause now just for a few minutes to pick up on a few of the questions that are in the chat. Um, the first one really is goes straight to the nub of the matter. It says, uh, for most governments and MPs, the reason given for inaction on drug policy reform is the fear of public backlash, that they will be seen as being soft on people who use drugs, who many see as a menace to society. How, how would you deal with this as an MP? Uh, anybody on the panel want to respond to that question briefly? I'm happy to respond to that. I mean, we as parliamentarians, that we we must look at the evidence. We must look at what works and what hasn't worked. So why do we continue to repeat the policies that make matters worse? Uh, when we're looking at law enforcement, we have to, here in the UK and across the world, we have to police by consent. If you are alienating and marginalizing black and brown people, Roma people through drugs policy, how can you gain the trust from them to help you with more serious crimes? Uh, to, be a, to be a parliamentarian, to be a politician, first and foremost is to be honest. Secondly, I would argue to be brave and do right by all communities that we cannot police by consent. We cannot be the politicians seeking to serve all our communities if we are putting blinkers over our eyes and ignoring the truth. The, the truth of the matter is 
that too much drug policies looks to the most vulnerable, the weakest, those with the least amount of voices uh, in our in our society. Now's the time to be brave. Thanks very much, Simon. And um, there's a lot there about evidence and following uh, policies that pursue evidence. Uh, the, one of our other questions sort of takes the other um, aspect of this and says, well, a lot of public pressure um, is needed to change drug policies. And um, the public opinion, I don't know which country this question comes from, uh, needs a lot of strategy of demystification of drug use. Uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, proportion of the voting public are are scared or have fears around drug use running out of control if reforms are implemented. Um, and that's another reason why politicians do uh, uh, sometimes stray away from uh, uh, this subject. Uh, anybody on the panel want to respond on the issue of demystifying uh, uh, the issues around drug use for voters? Mike, I'll have a go at it um, oh, from a health uh, practitioner perspective. I think we in the health profession um, have not done enough to educate the public on um, the root causes of drug use, whether it's poverty, whether it's um, you know, peer pressure, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, through decades of the war on drugs, the for, for the public, it's um, this ideology that drug use is, you know, due to um, an inherent weakness and, and bad people. So I think um, the science behind the causes, uh, you know, the risk factors uh, that lead um, young men and women into drug use, as well as um, you know uh, the, the 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 science behind addiction itself, uh, have not been communicated well enough to the public. And um, I think, in in a way, um, us in the health profession um, are to be blamed for that. Yes, absolutely, Adiba. And uh, I, I often think as I go around uh, the world sort of having conversations with people about uh, drug policy is that some of the basic understandings of why people use drugs, why they get into trouble with drugs, why there are social problems associated with drugs. There are some really basic misunderstandings of how those things uh, operate. And uh, it would be very useful, and it's maybe something we can consider in this network of producing some very simple factual guides around um, uh, the data of uh, the types of people and the reasons why people use drugs, the data around why for some people their drug use goes out of control, which, as we know, is very closely associated with social and emotional conditions, um, and also why drug markets operate as they do. People assume that uh, because there is violence in the drug market, because there is bad behavior um, around the scenes where drugs are used, they assume that is uh, because this is generally a bad activity. They don't, uh, they don't make the link between that and the marginalization and the illegal nature of the markets. Once you create an illegal market, you will have uh, violent behavior associated with it. We know that uh, from other illegal markets that uh, uh, apply around the world. So I think that's right. It's there's some uh, to create the public understanding and the understanding of legislators. There's some very basic conversations to be had about what how these problems have developed and where they come from, what the stimuli are. Um, I've always been a fan of the journalist Johan Harry, who wrote the book Chasing the Scream, and uh, it's it, I think it's a damn fine read for anybody. But the one thing that Johan gets absolutely right is when he talks about why people become addicted to drugs. And everybody talks about, well, you're either addicted or you should be abstinent, and that shows you're not addicted. But Johan changes that argument and says, the opposite of addiction is connection. When people feel loved, they feel supported, they feel connection with the people around them, there is no need for them to uh, pursue safety or pursue comfort in, in drugs. And uh, that is not a concept understood or known by um, uh, by majority of people, I would say, but it's a very true concept. So it's challenging some of those basic uh, 
expectations we have from having a century of, of punitive drug policies, challenging some of those basic understandings that creates the public, uh, more public support for uh, our reforms. Um, we have one other question I'd like to take now. Um, uh, that's before we move on to our country examples. A real practical problem raised on the chat here is in many countries, there's not that many parliamentarians who have subject interest in health issues or, 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 or drug policy issues within health issues. How can we make sure that uh, more, uh, more people, more parliamentarians uh, take an interest in the health aspects of drug use and make sure the decisions are based on evidence? So there's a real practical problem that in many uh, legislatures, uh, there aren't that many enthusiasts for this issue. Uh, how do we get around that? Any input from our panel? Seth. You're on mute, Seth. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very well. It is all part of the building process. I call the building process because knowledge, when not adequately shared, necessarily do not get a buy-in. And until the information is put out there by the few of us who have come more into contact with the public health issues and how endemic it is on our sustenance as existing humans. Most of the people wouldn't know because they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the information. And many parliamentarians do not have such capacity. And so for us in Ghana, what has really helped us is our partnerships with civil society organizations like IDPC, Release, Transform, and the lot that has really encouraged us to manage the situation in respect to the conversations. So indeed, it is knowledge that needs to really be shared, capacity to be enhanced. And this is my little take on this. Thanks very much, Seth. Um, and uh, if there are no other contributions at this stage, I'm gonna move us into the uh, country presentations. Um, and as I said, at the top of the meeting, we have uh, uh, three uh, speakers from around the world who are going to tell us about some parliamentary activity in their own countries. And you've just heard from uh, Seth Achiampong, uh, and it's actually Seth and his colleague, Marie Garettiani, who you're going to hear, for, uh, hear from next. Um, because of the connections we have today, we have pre-recorded this presentation but obviously you will have a chance to put questions to Seth and Maria uh, at the next Q&A session. So uh, I'm assuming our colleagues in the technical department are ready to play the pre-recorded presentation from Seth and Maria. Let me take this opportunity to thank UNITE for inviting me to be part of UNITE. And so it gives me a lot of gratification to speak at this meeting for the first time as a member of UNITE. And upon this, I wish to take the Ghanaian journey. In the past three decades, Ghana passed a law called the PNDC Law 235. And that law mainly operated on two principles in drug policy. Here we talk about the policy on demand reduction and supply reduction. However, we all know that the fundamental goal of drug policies should be to improve the health, safety, security, and social economic well being of our people. And clearly, these were completely missing in the old law. In the last decade, civil society and experts, such as our Ghanaian revered 
Secretary General, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofian, and members of parliament like myself, through advocacy on the various platforms that we've had, have made urgent, a demanded urgent reform in the field of drug policy here in Ghana. Very important, and I would want to say briefly that the core games of our new law, which we just enacted this year, must, I must admit that it's not a perfect law, but at least it has set the pace for better things to happen in our sub region. The new law has converted, particularly the prison term for drug possession from for personal use into a fine. And this ranges between two to 500 penalty units, which in CD terms comes to like 2,400 Ghana cities and then 6,000 Ghana cities. It means that instead of sending people to prison for up to 10 years of incarceration, you for simply possession of drugs for personal use, they will have offered alternatives to this incarceration. This is in line with current programs and policies to decongest prisons in Ghana here, notably the Justice for All program, which was initiated in 2007. The new law also allows for the first time the implementation of life-saving harm reduction services for people who, are, who use drugs, which will help curb the transmission of blood-borne viruses such as HIV, hepatitis B and C, overdose deaths, and drug dependence. Another key area that has been of great interest to us is the incorporation of some special provisions relating to cannabis. The new law will regulate the production of cannabis products that contain very small contents, amounts of to the content of 0.3% of dry weight of THC, a key compound that is associated with cannabis, high for industrial, medicinal, and research purposes. Honestly, I must admit that this could only be achieved through the contribution of CSOs and IDPC, OSF, OCWA, as well as members of parliament like myself from either side of the divide, who in good and for good reasons have helped with the bipartisan approach, all party group to advance this law. First and foremost, the role of MPs for this cross-party engagement cannot be understated. It's important for people who are on committees of drug policy in parliament to be retained in the committees for institutional memory and for legitimacy. MPs must be open to the role of CSOs and see CSOs as agents that can bring about international engagement. Here, I want to take opportunity. For example, in 2014, international experts team joined our parliamentary workshop in Ghana to engage us on model legislations and that enhance knowledge of committee members on drug policy reform. Examples are MPs like myself, who had opportunity to be on London in Chatham House on APPG or Parliamentary Party Group as Association, and then the African uh, Fellowship on Drug Policy by release for MPs to improve expertise and knowledge in the field, and then joining government delegations to the Commission on Aquatic Drugs in Vienna, a global meeting that helps with great exposure for members of parliament. Furthermore, we also need to be considered in identifying when legislature persons who have expertise in agriculture, pharmacy, chemistry, public health expertise by mobilizing them for discussions and support, especially on drug policy reform, medicinal cannabis, etc. The need for MPs to know the strands of outlook for drug policy within parliament and out of parliament can never be overemphasized. And the need for MPs to understand the political as well as the political economy of drug policy reform can also never be overemphasized. That is very extremely important for parliament to get support from sectors so, so that they can engage the executive in an African contest parliament in practice and as a very distinguished form of theory, which must bring all of us within the legislature and the executive to connect in drug policy reform. I believe when these things are really adhered to and followed and pursued, we will come back here another time in a beautiful meeting to see the progress Africa would have made. I want to thank you for this opportunity, for this brief statement, and I'm grateful to you. Thank you, Seth. And um, we, now the organizers will be putting up the uh, second half of this 
prepared presentation from Maria Gorettiani. Thank you very much, Honorable Echampo, for the great highlights on these um, gentle strides that have been made by Ghana towards um, humane drug policy. Um, like Honorable Echampo mentioned much earlier in his intervention, um, this progress was possible due to diverse stakeholders, including critical role civil society played in this whole process. Um, I must say that it was due to constant gentle pressures, relentless engagements, meetings here and there, one-on-one, -on -one, focus group discussions, and then also, more importantly, the constant interaction with MPs and the space that they created to welcome us um, for this continuous dialogue. Um, I must say that, of course, the um, MPs played a critical role but um, uh, I must admit that civil society, to some extent, brought pressure, uh, I mean, gentle pressure through this journey and made it possible for us to be able to get to where we are today. And I am here today to at least share some experience with everyone about some of the things civil society did and also the lessons we have learned that we wish to share with the rest of the participants in the, during this conference. A major contribution of civil society was ensuring that much awareness was created on the issue. Um, in addition, civil society brought to the table gathered evidence, because if you're engaging in most of these sensitive or very um, issue, uh, issues that were seen as a taboo in the region to be discussed, because most governments saw drug-related issues as a security issue, so the space was very narrow for that conversation. So in order to make these gains, you need to, be, you need to make sure that you have the evidence to be able to present to these policy makers to ensure that that happens. And that was exactly what civil society did. Civil society made sure that we gathered the evidence, we brought on table, we kept on pushing, and our message was consistent throughout, and that's it was necessary for Ghana to begin to see the drug policy conversation through the lens of health, development, and human rights concern. And this clearly shows how far we have come as a country and the need to promote a healthier and a safer, uh, I mean, a safer country. First and foremost, Ghana's example shows that civil society and government can engage in dialogue to realign our country's priorities to ensure participation, to advance sustainable development, and also to seek a brighter future for our, uh, our citizens. One other lesson learned is that as activists, we must stay focused on the evidence. That is something we must bear in mind all the time. We must be willing to go the extra mile to fetch the evidence and share with governments if we need policy truly change. And um, within this space, you have to also make sure that you appreciate other perspectives and views in the discussions during such um, sessions. So for instance, um, civil society, make sure that we also engage other civil society organizations that did not necessarily agree with our stance. We made sure we engage them, we brought them to the table, we had a lot of dialogue on the issue. And that actually created the space for us to be able to um, bring these issues before them. And also, to some extent, they also, uh, at a point in time, agreed with some of the issues we have raised, especially the need to begin to see drug use as a public health issue and not a criminal justice issue. Last but not the least, one of the biggest lessons learned from the Ghana's process has been that civil society needs to engage widely. I remember um, Honorable Seth a champion talked about the fact that you need, as parliamentarians, you need to make sure that you, do, you, you engage broadly. So civil society, what we did was to ensure that we engage more broadly, both the upper and lower chambers. We made sure we engage with the judiciary, um, other opinion formers, the media and social media was widely used. Um, we know, all know that the media is an opinion format and they must always get their message right. 
Hence, they need to make sure that we engage them effectively. So um, going forward, I believe that civil society, government together can bring a lot of policy changes in this field if we continue to work in a healthy environment, we continue to understand ourselves and even the need to open the space for that engagement to happen. Um, last, on, I mean, last but not the least, I would want to say that I'm really grateful this conversation is taking place through this medium and network of global parliamentarians that others will learn from the Ghana example how parliamentarians open the space for civil society to make these great inroads. Thank you, Unite, and all your partners for the space for us to be able to share this experience with everyone today. Thank you. I'm most grateful for this opportunity. And thank you, Maria, and also to Seth. Um, a very clear presentation and also an amazing achievement within Ghana. Uh, you are both too humble to say that you are two of the main architects of what's been a very positive reform that will have a big impact on your country, but also is a beacon for other countries in the region and, and internationally. So uh, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, uh, and I'm sure you will have some questions later in the session. Um, so from Africa now, as we can do in this virtual world, we are going to lightly leap across to South America. And we are joined by Rodrigo Velez, uh, um, who has uh, worked for many years in drug policy reform within Ecuador, within the administration and outside. So, Rodrigo, I'll uh, leave to you to describe that history and also the experience of the Ecuadorian uh, reforms. Rodrigo, over to you. You're still on mute, Rodrigo. I'm okay. Are you listening? Yeah. Uh, good day, everybody. I would like to thank Unite for inviting me to be part of this very important summit and having this unique opportunity to gather with other parliamentarians and uh, researchers who are working on the approach of the socioeconomic phenomenon of drugs. Uh, I just would like to say a very uh, a simple sentence uh, that it had to do with one of the questions. I think we have to detox the narratives. That's very important. That will uh, help a lot. We are uh, trying to work very hard on that. Well, now um, I'm going to share with you the Ecuadorian experience on what we define as an evolution and involution of the drug policy. Uh, uh, we push a shift that uh, we decide to have a shift that the policy uh, had in Ecuador from a very punitive extreme to the middle point of more human uh, rights centered approach and also moving from from the war on drugs to the uh, uh, socioeconomic phenomenon trying to understand that um, and we did what would be the first analyze the devastating impact of a punitive and prohibitionist policy that Ecuador has during the 90s and the and the first decade of this century, uh, with, with uh, overcrowded prisons, sentences out of, out of proportion related to the crimes. Um, then the, the, the turning point was uh, the year 2008. Uh, we had the new constitution that the state, a new principle related to the drug field that encompass various uh, various social rights, the principle that forbids criminalizations of, uh, of consumers and recognize the rights of drug users and no user at the same level. Um, in the same year, we implement the amnesty for small traffickers. And that way we come out with uh, 2,221 people freed from prisons uh, and out of them, 60% were women. Um, then we start working in some uh, some policies uh, and start uh, writing a new law that will explain a little bit later. Uh, the year 2014, uh, we have a new penal code. This law includes the thresholds. They provide, uh, they provide judges with a technical and legal resource that will allow them to distinguish between drug users 
and different scale traffickers and apply a uh, principle which is uh, very important, the principle of proportionality. Uh, with this reform, 2,148 people got the freedom back. Uh, the next year, 2015, Ecuador finally adopted the new law, uh, the new law in, in drugs. Um, and uh, and some main characteristic of this new law that differentiated from the previous one, it was a very punitive. Uh, we create an intersectoral committee uh, to design and implement drug policy with a balanced approach between health, security, and sustainable development. Uh, establish the need to implement comprehensive preventive programs for families, for labor force, and educational system. And uh, also a specific professionals and departments were included in the school system to take care of the, of the uh, mental health. Um, the alternative preventive development was adopted as intervention strategy for communities that have been impacted by socioeconomic factors, which led them to relate with illicit activities in the drug field. Um, in September 2015, then when we start with the involution, uh, a modification of the threshold was implemented. This reform reduced the quantities of the substance uh, for the different scales on the, of, the, of the threshold and also increased the terms. Uh, imprisoned people for drugs offenses went up to 206% in a period of four, four years. Uh, then in the year 2018, an executive decree as a strategy of reducing the size of the government, uh, the drug secretariat was eliminated and its competence were divided between health and security institutions. Uh, the next year, 2000, uh, the 2019, uh, we signed a, a binational agreement with the United States, a military agreement, which means uh, we still import and fail policies that have caused high constitutional cost and great impact on the social health of our nation, not only in the public health, but and the social health. Uh, the 2020 as the country faced the consequence of a health emergency that has overcrowded the public health system as a result of the COVID-19, the legislature approved a new law against consumption and micro traffic. We have already previously like explained uh, a, a new law on drugs by the legislature on the middle of the pandemic they uh, they approved this this new law that was not consulted enough with the civil society and also with the people involved. This law doesn't recognize the right protected in the constitution for users and consumers, generate a stigma toward consumers who are against criminal laws. Uh, well, at least we have one one positive um, action here in the, the parliament approved uh, the law for the for the use of medicinal cannabis. Now, what the drug policy advocate should take into consideration for the future, we suggest evaluate the impact that, that the public policy has had in terms of social health, people rights, and the accomplishment of the SDG 2030 implement programs and action plans based on evidence and the realities of their territories. Shift to the development and justice path. Participation of the citizen is key. Nothing about us without us. Consider the collective and mental socioeconomic damage of COVID-19 as a major contributor for the drug phenomenon in the year to come. I think this is uh, something important that we, we have to discuss. Um, and also promote the restorative justice when it's possible, prioritizing children, teenagers, and women. We have uh, many examples, like in New Zealand, um, did a long time ago, 
this is uh, an important issue. Uh, and the international level, uh, we have to we have to incentivize. We have to in, uh, re uh, reactivate the South South cooperation, not only within the regions, but as a whole. Uh, I'm sure that together we can achieve greater results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Um, and once again, Rodrigo is available for questions in our final session. Uh, we're now going to whiz very quickly across to Southeast Asia. Um, we're joined by Professor Adiba Kamaro Zaman. Uh, welcome, Adiba, who's going to talk to us a little bit about some uh, reform discussions in Malaysia. Adiba, over to you. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you to Unite for having me on this panel. Um, if I can just uh, go back a little bit on the history of, of uh, the um, drug policy reform activities in Malaysia actually went back to um, the harm reduction initiatives that occurred in 2005-2006 um, as a result of um, the HIV epidemic. Uh, where 90% of um, the people living with HIV in Malaysia at the time were uh, people who inject drugs. Um, I think, as many of you would be aware, Malaysia has always taken a uh, punitive uh, criminal justice approach to dealing with drug use for the last five decades, um, beginning with the heroin epidemic in the 70s. We have, uh, and we still do, have the death penalty for drug use and for, for drug trafficking. We, um, we uh, have, still have the mandatory uh, drug detention centers uh, for people who use drugs. And uh, we incarcerate people for uh, drug use and possession. So um, in the absence of um, effective HIV prevention services in, in the late 90s um, and early 2000 when um, HIV uh, started spreading around Malaysia, uh, it was no surprise that um, the majority of people who became infected were amongst people who inject drugs. And so um, civil society started advocating in, in early 2000 and we finally got the nod from the government uh, to implement needle syringe program and methadone maintenance treatment. One of the reasons was because uh, we were not of the, at the time, there were the Millennium Development Goals and of the six Millennium Development Goals, um, reversing the HIV epidemic was the only one that Malaysia didn't achieve. So we came at the right time, I guess, uh, in terms of advocating and at the midterm review, um, the government gave us a go ahead. And with that, um, the funding to um, uh, implement needle syringe program nationwide and methadone maintenance treatment. And we've seen success from that uh, these days. Um, in, at the peak of the epidemic, we were seeing between five to 6,000 new HIV diagnoses per year as a result of uh, injecting drug use. And now, um, a decade later, um, we, we're getting about or less than 500 new uh, HIV diagnoses from injecting drug use. So that's been um, a big success. But we also learned from uh, implementing um, harm reduction that this is not enough. Um, and the reason is because, you know, we, we of the people attending methadone programs or needle syringe program, they, they still, still live in fear of being arrested. And uh, of the 40 odd thousand uh, prison population, 60% are for uh, minor drug use. Um, and so uh, with the success of um, the harm reduction program, uh, the, the group of us uh, who've been advocating um, for harm reduction and subsequently drug policy reform worked um, even harder to convince our politicians and our parliamentarians. 
and the um, uh, the, the positive uh, vibes, I guess, came after the last election in 2018, when um, a new government came in after 60 years and um, had reform uh, very much on its agenda. And we had a, um, a health minister at the time who uh, understood the issues as a health issue and helped us advocate to fellow parliamentarians and uh, Minister of Home Affairs at the time, and as well as Minister of Law. Um, and we had, um, you know, we, we thought we were progressing very well with a declaration from the government uh, around the possibility of decriminalizing personal drug use and um, very strong statements from um, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister at the time, and uh, many senior ministers that um, drug use is a health and public health issue and a social issue and not a criminal justice um, issue. And, you know, we, we, we were certainly um, very, very pleased and continued to work um, in, in, in terms of making it happen um, obviously there, there are lots of things to be done you know we have so many drug laws and regulations um, so doing a, um, a law review was was high on the on the list of to do's um, uh, speaking to the judiciary the other members of parliament um, the public in general were all things that we had um, Land and and also of course uh, what model was this uh, decriminalization going uh, to take shape in? Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, well, I don't know. Um, a new government has come in, and I think um, that reform agenda has uh, taken a back seat uh, a little bit. Um, I do believe uh, in our presentations to members of parliament. We had two since um, since. Uh, 2018, um, I, I do believe that individually many members of parliament actually understand the issue and understand that uh, too much harm has come about uh, from a punitive approach. Uh, many of them have had personal um, encounters uh, either through their own families or uh, through their constituencies. Um, and, you know, when, when we went to Parliament, they, they said, yes, this is something that we need to do, that there needs to be a, um, um, what do you call it, a, a, a bipartisan um, uh, parliamentary uh, group that looks into this issue um, seriously and, and deeply. But as I said, uh, as we were moving forward, there was a change in government. And uh, personally, I feel that this is... Uh, probably not the right time to to push too hard because you know the, the current government has uh, a lot of um, things on the agenda so we we the the activists and the reformists have taken a back seat a little bit to let you know the political situation in the country settle down but I I honestly do think that um, many parliamentarians do understand um, but collectively, um, under pressure from uh, police, under pressure from the the, um, uh, the drugs agency, and under pressure from the public at large as well, um, that uh, collectively the the, the government um, are not pushing hard for this reform. Having said that, there are um, uh, there have been um, several meetings to actually uh, look at perhaps um, uh, some aspects of decriminalization um, for personal use. Um, there is uh, a lot of uh, resistance towards um, decriminalization of personal possession. So um, as always, I guess, uh, for, for people who, who have been working in drug policy reform, it's, it's often, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of situation. And we, we're um, definitely experiencing that at the moment. But I remain um, uh, positive because I think that narrative of uh, drug use is a health and public health issue and, and you know, not... not um, 
a uh, criminal justice uh, or, or has to be looked at from a health and public health issue and the criminal justice is uh, kind of uh, uh, should be uh, limited to trafficking. Um, I think that that understanding is slowly coming in um, and that narrative, you, you hear more and more of that being discussed. So um, there have been some, some positive changes, I, I guess, but uh, a lot more uh, needs to be done. And I think if the global parliamentarians get together, as uh, you, we, can, we can hear from um, this uh, forum, Unite, perhaps, um, members of parliament who individually feel that you know they uh, they may get a backlash from their own constituency might feel um, a lot bolder to to take a more positive step um, and uh, make decisions based on on evidence as uh, Lord Simon Woolley said earlier. So with that, um, yeah, thank you for having me and, and look forward to further discussion on this. Thanks very much, Adiba. Um, and you've heard in very uh, quick order. And thank you to each of those speakers for staying very concise and, and, and to the point on their own country experiences. But we've heard experience now from Europe, from Africa, from South America and Southeast Asia. Uh, we now have about 10 minutes uh, for any uh, questions, uh, remaining questions to the panel. Uh, you submit those questions through the summit website uh the chat on the unite summit website and the uh, organizers will be passing them on to me i've got a couple to uh go ahead with but i did promise to you um at the top of the presenta uh, presentations to say that i would say a few words about the situation in new zealand now i'm presenting this to you as purely as somebody who just reads the news um uh, uh, the news feeds on uh, New Zealand. But for those of you who are not aware, New Zealand is the latest country um, that may be joining uh, some of the United States uh, states and Canada and Uruguay and uh, Luxembourg in, in Europe is in the process of doing this as well uh, to create a regulated market for, uh, for cannabis. Um, New Zealand uh, government um, under Jacinda Ardern had as part of its current government program uh, to offer the electorate in New Zealand a referendum on whether to uh, legalize cannabis. And what that means in practice is to create regulated systems for the distribution of cannabis um, and the use of it by adults and obviously medical use as well. Um, that referendum has been under a very heated debate in New Zealand the last couple of months. It was due to take place next week uh, on the same day as the general election day in New Zealand, but that general election has been put back by one month. Uh, so this referendum will take place in October. Um, the debate there has, uh, if I characterize it very simplistically, but has been a big debate between a lot of the scientific and, and research community and a more um, uh, instinctive, if you like, politics saying, uh, are playing uh, around fears of uh, massive increases in in prevalence of cannabis use in New Zealand society, and it is as it opinion polls show at the moment, it is absolutely balanced on a knife edge. So it is possible in one month's time that New Zealand becomes the next country to uh, introduce a uh, cannabis market. Uh, well, it will have a referendum result. If the result is positive, then the government says that they will intend to implement it, but obviously there are processes they have to follow. Um, or it's possible that the New Zealand electorate will reject uh, the proposal and that will, be, uh, uh, that will be that for some time in New Zealand. And as I say, the opinion polls are balanced on a knife edge right now. Um, that is uh, the most recent example or the current example of countries that are looking at cannabis regulation. Uh, we've talked uh, in some of these speeches about uh, decriminalization, which is removing criminal to penalties for possession and consumption of cannabis uh, or other drugs. Um, but obviously, the, uh, the further step is to actually remove the prohibition entirely and create a legal and regulated market. And as I said earlier, that has been the case with cannabis in, uh, I think we're up to 11 United States now, 
and obviously the whole countries of kind of Canada and Uruguay. Um, kind of uh, related to these debates we've had around cannabis and decriminalization, one of the questions I've uh, had received is about the distinction between uh, what we might call recreational or casual use of illegal drugs um, and dependent or addictive use. There is a general um, uh, proportion that seems to hold true in most cultures in most countries that of all the population that use um, uh, psychoactive drugs, somewhere around 10% could be said to develop problems, develop dependencies, develop addictions. Uh, so that means 90%, over 90% in many cases, of all the people who use drugs do not develop uh, significant uh, compulsive use or regular use or dependent use. Now, that is quite an important policy consideration, and it speaks back to what we said before about um, the image that most uh, um, of the electorate have when somebody says drug user. The image is of somebody who's strung out, is committing crimes, is, is having terrible health problems, has lost control of their life. But for the vast majority of drug users, that's not the case. And as an indication of that, uh, in the UK, I think at least 10 years ago, there was a campaign by uh, release, as it uh, was the pressure group, uh, that just simply had a slogan that says, nice people take drugs. And um, uh, that, in research terms, is a self-evident phrase. Um, but that uh, a campaign uh, was an aimed to be on posters and on the sides of buses, uh, they were prevented from even making that simple statement uh, on the sides of buses in London. So um, uh, this this idea that anybody who uses drugs is by nature a, a social outcast is very strong around the world. Anybody on the panel want to comment on that question? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. And I want to bring in... Um, some of the issues that we also encountered when we were dealing with this matter in our country. And what basically we did to be able to counter this kind of negative perception about people who use drugs was to try and involve people who are recreational users. And they are people who um, have a voice in society. So basically, we got people who were recreational users and um, who are also in policy making and all that to speak about their drug use without um, uh, um, um, being shy about it. And so it, it gave people that people began thinking, so if so-so and so in suit is somebody who has ever used drugs, then our thinking around people who use drugs is actually not true. And so um, people started um, opening up to the issue and it even gave the moral confidence to other people to even come up and also speak about their use of drugs or past use of drugs. So, you know, that thinking that anybody who uses drugs is an outcast, it's a, uh, somebody in shoddy clothing, I mean, that's kind of perception. We need to begin to speak about drug use, painting the picture of persons who use drugs as people who are just like ordinary people in our society. And so I think that picture being painted will help us to appreciate the conversation when it comes to drug use and not just seeing a drug user as somebody who is uh, a miserable looking gentleman or woman sitting in some uh, slums or things like that. We need to begin to picture people who use drugs as people who are just ordinary citizens of this country, people who are probably just judges, parliament, yet they are doing their work effectively. So that is how we should begin to have that conversation. And we need to make it very clear in all our deliberations moving forward. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, Rodrigo? Uh, Rodrigo? Uh, yeah, I just want to add what, what Maria just said. Uh, we have to uh, detox the narratives. Uh, it, it is important to uh, start with the education and uh, campaigns 
it uh, had to be related to the politicians, uh, community leaders, students. We have to talk in a different way about this uh, socioeconomic phenomenon. We have to take out of the narratives uh, the war on drugs because then, then we're going to have to stay in, in, in war, you know, with a security view of this uh, complex issue instead of a, a human rights center approach or, or a social health uh, approach. Uh, we, we, we have to move, we have to move from the war on drugs. It, it is important that uh, uh, the community uh, try to understand uh, that if we, if we start calling them narco traffickers or ex narco uh, or consumers or addicts or ex addicts, uh, it's very, it's going to be very hard to to get uh, get these people back to the normal social life, to a more productive life. We have to uh, stop stop using uh, words that uh, that insult them. Uh, 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 yeah, that's when I, I want to add with Thank Maria. Chair, chair, if I may say, if I may say. Okay, chair. Simon and then Adiba. That here in the UK, a mayoral candidate, conservative mayoral candidate, Sean Bailey, that made an announcement a couple of weeks ago that he wanted he wanted all office workers, uh, predominantly white office workers, to be tested, randomly tested for cocaine. Now, basically, what he was say, what he wanted to say was is that the, the target on drugs policy is towards black youths, and he wanted to say that white people take cocaine uh, too. The, the mistake he made was looking it through a punitive uh, drugs policy lens uh, to criminalize. Uh, his view was that white people should be criminalized as much as black people. Whereas the debate should be to have an honest conversation about drugs policy, about drugs use, that people take it, mostly recreational, they should be safe. Those that have problems ought to be helped, supported, and, and that way, we take the oxygen away from the gangs, we focus policing on bigger issues, and we begin to have a better understanding on why people take drugs and why people get into problems with, with drugs. So it is time for, I mean, I would say it in one sentence, an adult conversation about drug use. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Simon, and maybe a note to sales is for us to reach out to to uh, talk to him about this because we both know him and uh, uh, could probably help with that. Adiba, you are waiting to speak. Yeah, so, you know, although, as you said, only 10% of people who use drugs uh, end up having problematic um, drug use, this is often uh, the reason why, uh, you know, um, the, the police and, and others say that um, they need need to be put away in inverted commas because they're a nuisance to society, et cetera, et cetera. In, in Malaysia at the moment, the, um, uh, the use of ATS uh, uh, has, has led to, you know, uh, people with really problematic use having psychosis and you, you, you've also often heard the occasional murders uh, attributed to drug use and that is often used as an excuse uh, to put these people away. So we try and counter this by saying that, well, actually, for those people who have problematic drug use, being in prison is the worst place for them to be because prison guards um, and, and police in lockups are not trained to detect people who have uh, psychosis and, and other mental illness uh, with or without, uh, as, a, as a result of drug use. So. Um, this is one um, strategy that we're using that, you know, these, these uh, people should be in the hands of the health profession and not um, prison guards and, um, and police when they do have uh, problematic drug use. We do, we, we, uh, we feel that there is um, some understanding, but um, then the uh, police will counter us, but, but the law says that they need to be um, they need to go to prison. So, 
Yeah, those are. Um, I am hearing from the organizers that we are just over time. So uh, uh, I'm going to um, uh, draw the discussion to a close there. So thank you very much for the contributions from the panel. Um, we've had an encouraging range of experiences from around the world on initiatives to try and improve health provision and in initiatives to try to change drug laws. And uh, as we can see from these experiences, that reform is hard. But we have to remind ourselves what Simon said is changing the world is not hard, but we still get up in the morning and that's our objective. We're trying to change the world and just being right and having the evidence behind us is not enough. We have to be clear about our proposals and work hard to get them through the relevant authorities, in our cases, parliaments. I want to thank all of the panel for their efforts so far. You are people who've had a lot of influence, a lot of impact so far, but also for your time today and thank the audience for uh, your attention. Remind you that this is the start of the development of a network through Unite and the APPG. So please, if you're a parliamentarian or an advisor to a parliamentarian, please register to stay in touch. And we will be talking to you in the coming months about how you can pursue these progressive reforms in your own country and learn from the experiences of those who have been before you. So thanks to all of you for your involvement and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all the speakers. It was a very exciting panel uh, where uh, we were very proud to see Unite and the APPG announced as partners with the support of OSF. And uh, thank you all for your reminders that it is possible to change the world and, and to know, as long as we work hard and don't lose track on where we want to go. And that's what we're doing here together. We will now take a very short break uh, before returning with our next uh, panel session, which, which is hosted by our supporting partners at the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, on why the world needs a new global public health convention. We invite you to take this opportunity to network with other participants in the summit using the platform uh, that you already very well know. And please continue tweeting and, and sharing your, your questions with us uh, throughout the event. Thank you very much. And we will return for the next session at 2 p.m. Lisbon and London time.